drawing to come alive, if I want it to be graceful, I want it to smell for big bucks, I want the long axis to be curved. It's just going to have to happen, unless you're doing some real caricatured or wildly stylized drawing, then you can maybe make these robotic characters. But almost anything, look at Disney animation. It's all based on exactly the same classical model we're doing. They use almost all balls and the spaghetti legs in the wall too. But the connections are always on the curve. Always on the curve. Do that. Now, uh, let me divest, uh, divest. Let me divert here for a second. Let me sell you guys off. <laughs> um, when, just in terms of the learning process, one of the things you want to keep in mind, it's very frustrating not to get what you know you have the talent to get down on the page and you desperately to get. The problem is, when you work in any kind of craft, as I said before, you've got to do six or seven or ten or twelve simple to fairly difficult things all at once. You've got to juggle it. It takes a while to assimilate that information. You're always, in the beginning, missing one or two pieces to the puzzle. We're going to talk about structure for a while, and you don't have all the information on gesture yet, which is the most important part. That's going to make it a frustrating process. So keep that in mind. The other thing is, is you come in here with a certain level of craftsmanship, a certain level of information. And I think of it like a library. You've got this full library with all the books that get, have the information of your life. Your arm, you know. And you got from A to Z. And it's well ordered. It makes sense. What you do works well. You want it to be better, but it's working for you on some level. And then you come in, and I give you a new Z book, or a new X, or a new L book. And you have just enough space on the shelf for all your books to be in the perfect order. Now I'm giving you a brand new book, and it might be a great book, but you've got to rearrange the whole shelf to get that to fit in there. And that's what happens when you get new information. You have this conscious and unconscious filing cabinet in here where everything's perfectly ordered, makes sense, you know it makes sense. And then you get something brand new, and you go, oh, that's great. I want to use that. But how does that fit in with all this other stuff? And your mind, and mainly your unconscious mind, has to take and reorder everything to make that fit in. Some of the old books have to get thrown out. You find that now you have missing spaces where you need to get some new books you didn't know you needed before because it's a new area of interest. And you have to reorder your library. When you do that, what happens to your skill level is you don't get new information and you just start getting better and better and better. It's like the stock market. The next day, the next month, the next three months, you might get way worse. Overall, when you get new information, you're going to get better and better. But overall, in terms of months and years of your career, you're going to get better. From day to day, you'll never be able to predict exactly how well you're going to do. Every time I give you a new bit of information, or you get it from somebody else, or you just come up, come up with a discovery of your own, you got to reorder all the things you did before to make that fit, and that's going to create a mess. And that's probably going to mean you're going to draw worse rather than better. The other thing will happen if you're working on your drawings and painting, you start doing really well in your drawing, you'll probably start doing less well in your painting. It happens almost every time. It happens to me and every student that works on both of them. They'll start doing great in their drawing, their painting will look horrible. You can't understand how they're drawing so well. Painting so badly because they're drawing so well, or vice versa. So when you're getting new information, you can't expect it to immediately make you better. In fact, it'll probably, as I said, make you worse. It's very scary if you don't realize this. You go, oh my god, I've lost my talent. You come into the studio one day and you start painting and go, I don't know anything. I don't know how to start it. Because you're, this is all mucked up with this new stuff and trying to fix it. It will sort itself out. You will over get, overall get better. Even if it's lousy information, you'll bring it in there, try and fit it in, and maybe a couple weeks later you'll realize no, that doesn't work for me. You'll throw it back out. But it's going, it's going to have that, that effect on you first. So give yourself a break. When you're learning, give yourself permission to do really shitty work, because you're going to do it. Anytime you take the risk 
of learning something new, adding new information into your world, rearranging your world view, basically, it's going to have a bad effect before it has a good effect. So just keep that in mind. What I always try to do is just say, if I do a lousy drawing, the guy next to me is worried about the same problems. He's not going to take the time to, to look at me and think how lousy I am. He's going to be in his own misery next. So I'm worried about him. I just worry about myself. And it's OK if I do lousy. You're not going to do well in a class like this from day to day. You're, you're probably worse drawings here than you will on your own. Vern, my teacher, I studied with him for 10 or 15 years. And I never drew as well with it as I did without it. Because I was always worried about him coming around and correcting me. I was trying to work under his situation. He hired the model. He picked the length of the poses. He created the theme of the day. And I had to work under those restrictions. I would have preferred to draw the female when he had the male, or the muscular guy when he had the thinner guy, or have a better, different lighting angle than he picked. All those things affect you. So you're not here to do masterpieces. If you get something that's a good drawing, that's a bonus. What you're trying to get is information that you can apply down the road to your art and make your art in six months better, five years better, better, not right now. So keep that in mind. Now, real quick, let's start with the head. The head, if our uh, figure is a story, and I want to think of doing my art like telling or writing the story, if the figure's a story, the head's chapter number one. And the reason for that is as I talk, where do you look? You don't look at the biggest form on the body. You don't look at the form that's making contact that's holding me up. You look at my face. And that's going to be exactly the same in your art. When you do a painting of a landscape, and you got cows, 65 cows, and a barn, and the sky's got a little farmer sitting so there all over the farm. Everybody will look at the farm as soon as they can see it. And they'll look at the face of the farm. And then they'll move on to the other things. But you're going to go to the thing that's like you, that you can relate to. You know, it's eye to eye. You look at the face and the eyes first. So when they look at your drawing, the first thing they're going to see is the head. So you want to start with that probably since they're going to see that first. But the other side of that is, you start with the toes and then show them the complete figure, they don't know where you start with it. If you started with the head first grade, if not, they don't care as long as it all looks right. So the other reason I like to start with the head is I find that if people don't start with the head, more often than not, the head's stuck on the body. And I call them balloon drawings. They draw a really good shape for the head or a bad shape, whatever, and then they do the gesture of the body. The head is the first gesture of the body. The head has a gesture. Everything has a gesture. Head flows with or breaks away the rhythm of the rest of the body, rhythm of the arms, rhythm of the torso. So if you don't think of the head as a gestural rhythm that blends and relates against the other rhythms of the body, it's going to get stuck on no matter how well structured it is. So the, the big thing you forget is that the head must have a gesture just like everything else. And actually, the head has two gestures, because it's made up of two great forms, the skull shape that has the hair on it and the face shape that has the features on it. Remember, the long axis is a gesture. The center line down the features is a long axis of gesture of the face. The part down the center of the hair, or the imaginary part, will be the long axis of the skull. So if we start with a profile, gesture of the skull, gesture of the face, I can then group this into one big shape, or I can break it into two smaller shapes. Skull shape goes on the gesture, mask of the face goes on the gesture. The ear we're going to find is a very important structure because it separates the two shapes and it's going to help check the proportion and it's going to help place it very quickly into two and three dimensions, turning away from us, tilting out. The placement of the ear is going to quickly suggest the second and third dimension of the head. So we'll look at that. But what we're going to do is we're going to start with a head that's in any kind of profile, meaning any view where you see quite a bit of skull and hair, quite a bit of face. We see a bit of both, basically three-quarter to three-quarter. We're going to draw this bulging triangle and then build, it won't matter which way we're going this 
this way. This will be a nice shape to build our more finished head off of. Now, when I choose a shape for the body or choose a shape for anything, we want to make it two criteria. I think I mentioned this last week. We want to make it simple and characteristic. I went through that last week. Let me do that real quick and then we'll do our next set. When I choose a simple shape, it has to meet two criteria. I want it as simple as possible. The simple shape I or the shape I draw should be as simple as possible. Because I want to be able to get it down quickly. Drawing fast is not the art of making really quick marks. It's the art of making good, simple decisions. If it's very simple, I can get it down quickly. If Mickey's head's just a ball, I can get that down just like that. But if I worry about zygomatic arches and mentalis and corrugator muscles, all this kind of stuff, it takes me forever to do. So if I want to draw faster, I want to learn to draw simpler. Also, if I'm dealing with an idea, whether it's a structural idea or a philosophical idea, the simpler I can be, the clearer I will be. If you can make it simple and clear, What's physics trying to do? Physics with all this stuff, none of us can understand. Chaos theory, quantum mechanics, all this kind of stuff. What are they trying to do? They're looking for the unified theory. They're looking for one equation that will explain everything. That's what our mind looks for, is for the order, the simplicity of things. So if you can say, this is the way the world is, the world sucks. If you can make it simple and clear, they'll understand it. And then you can spend the next six hours expounding on why it sucks. But if you can give them a clear, concise idea, it's going to work uh, to your advantage. So we want to work quick by working simple. If I make it simple, I can animate it. So as I said, if we can make Mickey's head a ball, we can move that ball and draw it 50,000 times in some little short movie or something. If it's all this complicated contour and tonal relationships and Latin muscle and bone connections, it, it's hard to draw one, let alone several in the sequence. So we can't animate unless we can simplify. This is a two. With very little practice, almost anybody can learn to draw two. You know, we could learn in an afternoon how to make a tube flow through space and as it tumbles around, it wouldn't be too difficult. So we can animate it. But most of us aren't going to end up as animators. But we animate in another way, too. If I've got my model, and he's going to be a, uh, some Conan the Barbarian character who's just spearing some poor lizard man creature or something like this, he's going to be holding the pose like this. And what am I going to do? I want to make him do this. If he's getting shot like this, I want to make him like this. If he's sad like this, I want to make him despondent like this. I usually want to make it more dynamic, animate the pose, push the pose a little farther. That's animation too. And almost every artist you'll look at in the Renaissance, say, will have done that. Rubens will have these wild figures and all this kind of stuff. Michelangelo will put them into positions they couldn't possibly get in or to do the same thing. But we can handle it. And then the last thing we can do is we can design or redesign. If we can make it simple, we can make that face heroic or villainous or uh, weak and timid or arrogant. You can design the shapes and imbue them with character. And that's how you would work for ILM and create an alien or a spaceship for the next movie or work for Disney and come up with the characters for their next movie. If you want to work in development, in layout design, in character design, you've got to learn to make these things simple. If I can learn some of the basic shapes of human and animal, I can create a wolf man for the next Stephen King movie or the aliens in the Star Wars sequences. Just playing with the shapes. Cardassian or the, the uh, Klingons and Star Trek. Just take the brow ridge and exaggerate it. You've got a Klingon. Instead of separating the ear lobes from the jaw, grouping together, and you got a carcassi. Real easy. They're just shapes. I'll mix, I'll group them together. I'll break them into several parts instead of one part. I'll exaggerate the box and balls in two. Allows us to redesign. So to make it simple gives us all that control. Gives us lots of possibilities. 
The other thing, though, is we have to make it characteristic. And if we just did this, that would be a great way to draw a head rotating pelvis because it's the simplest shapes I could come up with. But it's not very satisfying, is it? So we have to have another criteria. It also has to be characteristic of what we see in front of us. If it's not characteristic, what we're going to find is, is we have to do a tremendous amount of work to finish it off. If this is David's, uh, Michelangelo's David in marble, think of all the chiseling I have to do to turn that into the finished head and the torso. <clears throat> if I don't uh, have time to finish it off, to put my technique on, if it's more characteristic, I still get the idea down, even if I have to stop. So if I'm in a hurry, short pose, quick deadline, if I have to make it really simple, or really simple, this takes a little longer than that, but this simple idea lets me know that it's a head in a profile. And I can know whether it's a male or a female, whether it's young or old, if I'm careful with those simple shapes. So if I have to stop, I still have the idea down, even at the simplest stage which is important. Not only if I have to stop, but as I build, if my idea is immediately established on the page, as I build and render on top of it, I've got that idea clear in front of me, and I'll know uh, with a little bit of practice how to build on that and keep that idea there. But if it's just, there's a head in there someplace, as I start rendering the details, I'm not quite sure it's working until the very end and it's too late to finish. But now I can build step by step on top of it and know pretty quickly if what I put is in character with the idea I established or out of character. Then the last and most important reason is if I don't get a good characteristic shape, I have terrible connections. Is the chunk of marble that I got for the head really in the right position? as it fits with the rib We have no idea because there's such crude shapes, our connections are very crude. And when we start to finish them off, we may draw this beautiful head, this beautiful rib cage, and this is too big, or it's too close to the jaw, and then I'm stuck. If I can get a simple but characteristic shape, I'll know very quickly, immediately, whether it's connected or and if there's a problem, we'll more quickly see the problem. And so that becomes the other criteria when the drawing is make sure you draw a shape that's sophisticated enough, that's well designed enough that you get an excellent connection. The connection, remember, is the hardest, most important part. So if we don't get enough information on the head, then we can really successfully and confidently connect the neck with the front. Because now this is off and everything's just going to get worse. A little air becomes a bigger and bigger. So make sure as you draw the shape, it's simple but characteristic and it's clear enough that we have a sense of how it's going to fit to the next shape. If you don't have that sense, keep working on that shape. Don't say, well, I'll come back and fix it later because then you're not really getting an idea. You're just saying that I'm going to come back and put a head somewhere in, inside that. All you've done is mark out the space you're going to solve the problem. You haven't dealt with the problem. You're just putting it off and it's going to get harder and harder to make work as you get more and more stuff on the page. So whatever you put down first has to be complete enough that it's going to help you connect the next thing to it and not be big enough that you don't know if the next thing is worth and the next thing is worth. And that's where we get in big trouble because we're so vague with things that we're not quite sure anything is working. And then it just becomes overwhelming. You get it 30 seconds or two minutes into the pose, and you got all this stuff, none of which you're quite sure is right, and you just kind of throw up your hands out and all this going on, you know how to fix this thing. So each step should comfortably and confidently lead to the next step. If not, we stay with that step. Even if we spend all two minutes or five minutes there and never get any farther. One of the things in these short poses, don't feel like you have to finish. If you just spend all 
five minutes on a thigh. That was time on a spit. All five minutes on the head and neck connection. All two minutes on the arm and forearm. That's fine. What you got was a really clear idea. Even if you made a mistake in it, you thought it through, and you go, now, no, we won't do that next time. And then you try again on the next ones. But if you rush through it, you just do a sloppy rendering, and you're not dealing with the real problems underneath. And every once in a while, you get a drawing that works. You just kind of attack, and it just magically worked out. And you go, ah, that's great. I can hang that up. And that encourages you to do the same thing next time. But it takes you another 12 drawings before you get another one that works pretty well. And six years down the road, it's still every 12 drawings, you get a pretty good drawing. But it's not any better than it was six years ago. And you're not improving. And you wonder why did you come religiously every Saturday teach you all the stuff, you're not getting better. It's because you're not, it's not because you're not practicing, it's because you're not practicing smart. If I get up there and say, okay, I'm gonna do that baseball, I'll pitch that sucker, and you do this every single Saturday for three hours, and then you get in the game, you're out, and you wonder why you're averaging and going up, because you're, not because you're not practicing, because you're not practicing good craftsmanship, good technique good thinking. You're not thinking through the process and solving the process. So let's stop there and do our next set. And let's do a three 10 minute poses. Now I, we barely start on the head, but wherever you start in the body, make sure it's a really well designed, good shape that sits on the page and that it's going to be nicely connected in the next shape. You're going to draw whatever shape you draw, start with a long axis, Make sure that that is curved so you get a sense of light. A skull connection to the back of my neck, and it's easily rendered out. I can refine that, I can dig out the eye socket, add on the nose, establish the hairstyle on top of that very quickly. And it's very easy to put into perspective, or nothing's easy when you're trying to make something three dimensional on your two dimensional page, but it's a logical process. Now, one of the things we need to realize, and notice that each of my uh, lines is curved. If I curve the line, that makes it more gestural. When it changes directions, when one part goes in a distinctly different direction than another part, we make a quarter. Curves and quarters, that's what we're making this out of. Same theory we, we talked about. Curve, give it five. <coughs> Corner, give it structure, we've got the best of both worlds. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. To make things more boxy, it doesn't have to be stiffer. Each line of the box can be bowed. And so it can still have its boxy perspective and yet be more organic. Now, a couple things. If I put this into a perfect box, it should be the a perfect square, or just a little bit longer in the jaw, especially if you're doing a, a, a nail with a strong jaw, a little longer in the jaw than back along the skull. But that's without the hairstyle and without the features. Once you add on the features and the hair, then this distance will, will uh, you know, take over this distance. But figure their body equal. This distance down should be about that distance back. The other thing we want is not a perfect right angle, but we want the back of the skull to be a little higher than the front. It will vary how high, depending on the person. And or the front and the bottom of the chin, a little forward pushing compared to the back of the, of the uh, top of the forehead. Hairline. So this opens up. It's not a right angle, it's beveled out, obtuse. It opens up. This is going to be higher than this. This is going to thrust forward a little bit more than this. One or both of those will conspire to make this lift. So it's going to open up. So make it about equal distance up and down. If it's not perfect, you can trim it off in the rendering room or sculpting so you can take a layer out a little clay if you need to. But um, make it about equal. The mistake most people make is they do this. 
and you're going to end up with not enough skull. You actually draw the proportion of it in front. Proportion from the side is almost square. Proportion from the front is two to three in proportion. You'll see that. So a lot of people do this, and then they end up with either no skull or a real sliver of a face, a squished face. Now, if we put this, put a, a center line right down through the middle, and a center line right across the middle, this would be about the eye line on average. That's about where the neck connects to the skull. You can feel that on your own. So this is an obvious connection. We end up with an hourglass kind of tooth. It's going from wide head to wide rib cage. So in profile, it's going to be an hourglass kind of idea. And I don't even bother doing this because I'm going to get a well-structured head, a well-structured rib cage. I don't care about the neck. It'll take care of itself. So I never even worry about the depth lines of the neck. You can put them in. So this is the eye line, this is the front of the ear. And the ear is maybe a little higher than this, but it's pretty much right across that axis, right in the middle of the head, pretty well. And now it's going to vary from person to person. Some people get lower ears, some get higher ears, some are bigger, smaller, but that's pretty close on average. What you will find, not exactly, but roughly, if you put another ear behind the first, and the ear can be a C shape or a little egg shape, each of those should drift back, fall away a little bit. You can feel it kind of opening up a little bit. And, uh, if I put another ear shape behind the first, that'll get me close, if not exactly to the back of the skull. So you want at least another ear behind the ear you've drawn to the back of the skull, and that's why we have trouble here. We do this, and there's not enough skull to get another ear. We can go back farther. So that's the proportion of it. It's in the, the front of the ear is in the halfway point, and we're about an ear or so away from the back of the skull before the hair stop. Now, the ear is the only feature on the side of the head. All the other features are on the front of the head, and that's great. But if I can establish some stuff on the front and something on the side, now I have two planes in relationship. I can create this corner, and I can get that third dimension. So the ear is going to be crucial in getting the dimensions of the head. Right now, we have a flat, perfect profile. We don't know anything about this, and we don't know about that yet. But if we orient the ear correctly before we do anything else, we get a ton of information. Here it is again. No line do I draw once. I draw several times so I can get the relationship. As soon as I put the ear here, where are we? We're behind the head a little bit, aren't we? As I do this, the ear starts to crowd the face. As I do this, the ear starts to crowd the skull. I'm drawing the same shape over and over again, same proportion. Here it is here. Here it is here. Now the ear is almost to the back of the skull. Now the ear is almost to the front of the face. This is going to be a th more or less a three-quarter front view. This is going to be more or less a three-quarter back view. Just by taking the same shape I drew over and over again and just moving the ear around. Also though, and look what I'm doing with the ear, I'm, I'm adding a thickness. If I'm behind the ear, I put a thickness behind the ear shape. If I'm underneath the ear, I put a thickness underneath the ear shape. If I'm on top of the ear, I put a thickness on top of the ear shape. So I think of it as a little C shape that has a thickness, a little slice. You know, if we're thinking of our simple shapes, it's a little slice of a cylinder. Sliver the cylinder and we cut off the front curve. Ear shape. So I can put the ear in perspective 
by adding that little thickness, and this will end up being rendered into the outer rim. So it won't be wasted in the rendering either, but it will establish a little thing. So you don't have to do that, but it then makes the, even the detail reinforcing perspective. Not only are we behind this ear, we're now a little bit underneath, or behind this head, we're now a little bit underneath this head, probably, because I drew the ear not only closer to the face, Higher, but I did it higher to the skull. And we said that it's kind of in the middle here. So if I move it up higher, it tends to, there's a few angles where this doesn't work, but it will tend to feel, as it gets higher to the skull, it will tend to feel like you're underneath the head, isn't it? Because as you get underneath the head, it starts to crowd the top of the skull, just like when you get behind the head, it crowds the front of the face. And this one, the lower we put the ear, the more we feel like we're on top. So not only are we three-quarter front view, we're slightly on top of it. Just by placing the ear, we didn't totally convince them, but we got kind of a long ways towards making them feel all three dimensions of the head, just by the placement of the ear. Every little detail should reinforce the structure of the bigger detail. So when I add an eyeball, an ear, a nostril, if it's not helping the bigger structure, there's something wrong. And the bigger structure, a gesture, as we'll find out later. Each detail should have a structural and gestural component, hopefully, to reinforce the bigger ones. So the ear placement is, is crucial. Now look where I put the corner here. You can take the round skull or the round hairstyle, and if you chisel it out, then you get that boxy model that works kind of nicely. If I look at where the back corner of our box would be, again, about an ear away. Here's my back. Here's the side of the skull. The back of the skull goes into perspective. The ear is more or less at the back of the skull. Here is that back corner, more or less, at the back corner of the skull. Now these things you round off, but if you chisel it out, you can feel that idea. Here, the, on a three-quarter view, you'll find that the ear pretty much finishes at the end of the skull. They line up more or less on a three-quarter. So we don't have to worry about it at all. So that's the, the, uh, the basic placement of, of the ear. Now, when I do a detail, I don't like to let it float. Even if I orientate that just right, it's still floating. There's nothing touching it. So whenever I draw a new detail, sometimes you have to break this rule, but almost never do you have to. It should touch something else. Then it's connected. Then it's related. If I'm painting, if I paint the warm flesh against a cool shadow, if I leave white canvas between, I can't really see if I'm getting that sense of light I want. I have to touch the colors together to see if they're related. I have to touch the forms together, touch the gestures together, see if they're related. But I don't want to float it inside, I want to touch it. And in this case, what we will do is we will touch it against the mask of the face. Simplified hairline, jawline to the chin, that's the mask of the face. How simple you make that hairline is up to you. If it has a widow's peak, and a sideburn area, you may want to draw that. I usually do, actually. Because as you make this more and more accurate, it starts to crowd the eye, and the eye socket as we'll draw in the next break. And now these distances are pretty short to measure. Here's the uh, eye structure takes a certain amount of width. We have something fairly equal before we get the sideburn and less. Now we got the ear. That's going to make that ear pretty accurate when I can break that big distance down into shorter steps. So if I can do a fairly sophisticated hairline, that makes it all the easier. But if not, I'll just do a generic swinging from top of the forehead to front of the ear and back of the jaw. The jaw goes in front of the 
ear, not behind it. Sometimes you've got a guy with a big neck or it's pinched here and it'll feel like the jaw goes behind. It doesn't, it goes in front. That's usually the way you want to draw it. If it went behind as I talk, my ears would be doing this. It goes in front of it and that will be the massive place of pleading. Your now is touching your mask shape. Also, I want it to touch through construction line the eyebrow line. And that's going to get more and more important. Put the, add that on so you can get the sense of its reality here. Do a construction line from eyebrow line to ear. Now we're assuming that the ear is about the same height as the eyebrow line. Sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower. Don't do the eye line. We'll talk about why another time. But, but try and use the eyebrow line. And that's going to help us, especially when we get to the front view, to really help establish the third dimension. Eyebrow lines on the front of the box, ears on the side of the box. Now we're going to really get a nice perspective of it. So let's stop there and we'll do our, uh, our last set. But that gives you start. Bulging triangle, the placement of the ear becomes crucial. How close it is or far away from the mask of the face of the skull. How close it is or far away from the top of the skull. Pushing up against the mask of the face. Construct it across to the eyebrow line. And you're going to get it well plotted out. It's now placed by two relationships, eyebrow line and mask. Touching two different things. That should orient it well. The neck comes off the chin and the back of the skull. If you start to get behind the head, here's our hourglass shape again. But also, look at this. Ear lobe, that goes right down to the pit of the neck. That's a nice way to connect, get an extra connection. And we'll learn how to do all this but it really helps lock the head into relationship to the torso. So that when you get this, uh, these kind of three-quarter views, basically, go to the earlobe, go just draw right down to the pit of the neck. And you've got a, an extra connection. You just notice the neck will start to flow out into the shoulders like this, but this will take us right down, this will take us right down and now we can kind of triangulate to find that connection to the ribcage. These are that hourglass figure as well. The throat going out to the chin, the back of the neck going out to the skull, and swinging out to the wider shoulders or the ribcage. That's the hourglass. Okay, so let's stop there and then we'll look at the other views of the head uh, next week. So let's do uh, five fives, Mike. School <laughs> to make a, a painting work. If it's going to work, probably the shape and the value are going to be the most important part of it, unless it's more drawing than painting. And to do that, you need to think in terms of silhouettes. So the shape is what contains the value, and the value is reflected in the shape. But they really go together. And so you want to think of the mass of it, and not the edge of it so much. And you don't want the shape to be too careful, or else you start worrying along the contour. You want it to be simple and broad, but fairly uh, characteristic of what you see. If you um, I always read it to our spirit or uh, Charles Hawthorne in uh, the book that we read. It's one of them says if you put the right shape in the right spot, the drawing will take care of itself. So if you find this triangle of light and the cheek, make it a triangle of color and put it in the right spot, you've got the cheek. The right color in the right spot and the right shape of the three value in the right shape of the right to give you the drawing. So as a good painter, you want to draw half 
after the fact. You want to mass in the shapes of color, the shapes of value, and then come back and close the drawing back on it. Try and think of those masses. And those masses will start out flat, graphic at first, and then start to deal with sculpture, turning the plane from the plane. Now, the reason we want to uh, use the shape of value is we need something to hold the back, something to build a more careful drawing or anything off of. But the uh, reason value is important is because of this simple rule different value equals different plane. Different value equals different plane. Every time you see a value change, and that is a plane change unless it's just a little color sheet. But assuming the same color throughout, more or less, when we make the fingers get the value of the back of the hand, it gets turned toward the way the light source has gotten lighter and lighter than the other. So every time you establish a new value plane, a new value change, you create a new plane. Light, medium, dark or medium, light, dark, or light, medium, dark, it doesn't matter, it depends what light source is. As long as you're consistent with that, you will sculpt out your structure. Bottom gets darker, bottom gets darker, bottom gets darker, bottom gets darker. And then consistently, you'll read as a sculpted, realistic figure that comes out of the paper. So different value, different plane. The other side of that is same value, same plane. If you make them the same value, if you make uh, this the same value as this, or this the same value as this, you flatten it. And so the total structure that you create, part of it, well not part of it, all of it really is you create these differences in space. Yeah, unless it's just a local color, like the black here, or like the black, that kind of thing. You're creating a structure of space, and when you make them the same value, you flatten the canvas in that area, no matter what your drawing says. You might have the railroad track perspective vanishing, but, but in terms of tonal structure, it is flat. So if we want to create volume, if we want to pull something out of the light or out of the shadows or make it come off the canvas, it has to have a value change that looks around it. The ball gets lighter as it comes towards us, and that will give the illusion that it looks out of the canvas. Those kind of things. So different value, different plane. The flip side of it, the same value, same plane. So I realize that to make the same value flat. Now that's going to be a tool we'll use back and forth. Some areas we will want to flatten so that they don't draw any interest. All your things that really pull out of the paper, that really change their value from light to shadow, get more sculptural and get more attention, more interest. So like a loud person, you're going to hear them strong. If you have a loud value system, light to dark, going to come out closer. So areas that we're not interested in spending any time in or don't want our viewers to look at very carefully or at all will make the same value or similar value. And that will draw less attention and create less structure. And for the same reason, less structure creates less attention. Now, this rule works in another way. Different value, different plane different value, different plane. If you make the foreground a different value or value range in the background, then it will separate from the background. But if you make the middle value figure the same value as the middle value background, it starts to merge and again you lose that separation. So one of the problems we have, we start rendering, we say the, the, we see the middle ranges on the flesh, the middle ranges on the Mantle, the middle ranges of the reflected mirror. We make all the same value, even though we beautifully painted it or carefully rendered it, and flattens out. So we have to make sure that if we want to really separate that figure on our canvas, really give it volume, it doesn't just have each form 
change in value, but the whole value system of the figure is different than the whole value system of the value. Maybe four cent difference. When it starts getting the same value of flat, then you can make it a different value system that will separate. This doesn't separate very much. Now it's drawn separate from the background, but it's sitting flat with the background because it's about the same value. But the hair isn't. That would, see how that head really jumps away from the light and waves of the light sky? Really pulls away from us. Different value, different plane. Really pulls up. The light and dark features have a stronger value contrast than the middle or the light. This is all light to light middle. This is light to dark. Full value range in the face, limited value range in the wings. Dark silhouette in the hair, light silhouette in the wings. It separates out. But if I made this really light and this really light, or this full value and this full value, it would flat. So I have to work on two levels. Different value, different plane to separate the form from its front to side and top to bottom, and different value, different plane to separate, to separate space, the foreground and background relationships. And so a combination of how many values we assign to a form, how many values we assign to a silhouette, a foreground or background, which of those we make the same or different, all that inspires to create more form or less form and more interest and less things. So if I give the figure a middle value and the background a dark value, different value, different plane, it separates. There's not huge value changes in the flesh, so it doesn't really sculpt. The flesh doesn't sculpt. There's, we get a sense of modulation, but it sits fairly flat. But the whole silhouette really separated. Now the darker we go in, or the stronger we go in contrast between planes, front of the plane, side of the plane, front side, front side, the more sculptural it will be. And you can see how sculptural rim range is. Light is on the front, dark is on the bottom. Light is on the front, dark is on the bottom. Light on the front, dark on the bottom. It's darker on this left side, lighter on the front and right side. Lighter in the foreground figures, darker in the background. Different value, different plane. Different value, different plane. Same idea. Full value in the foreground, dark value in the background. See the same formula. He's using a formula here. Yeah, so when you can then play games, if you start to make them the same or similar value, it will flatten the structure. We don't feel the volume of the sleeve and the shoulder there, so it's flat. And we don't feel the separation very well of foreground and background. They're almost linear. But then we get a big blend in here, big separation here. So we play these games, this gets flatter, 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 sculpture. And now we now the whole thing was volume. There's volume in the background, there's volume in the foreground, there's volume in the light, there's volume in the shadow. But as a painter, as a designer, we can limit the volume or, or take out the volume, the solid the roundness, anywhere to make it a bigger impact here. So if you guys would just shut up, I can say what I want to say. But if we all talk, then we all might have something really important to say, but nobody gets heard. And that's the theory here. If this will shut up, if the hands will be quiet, if this will just lose its identity, then this has more personality. It's the main character of our story. And your writers will do it. Orchestration conductors will do it. Brass section is going to go more easily, and then the wind section can really play it up. Or, or these three singers will sing softly, and the soloists will play it up. This reduction of some detail, bring more interest in other detail, works throughout the arts. You can 
can see he's got this separated from the background. This must be the similar value. Now it's this value, about the same value as this. It's a little darker, but we've isolated it with dark. So the dark separates light from light. So we get dark to light in the figure and only middle to, to uh, light in the background. So this is a fuller value where it separates more, but not as dramatically as this. So how, how strongly do you, do you push it? But that's the basic idea. Different value, different plane. It works this way, and it works this way. These planes in space, or these planes in space. Same thing. Let's stop there, and then I'll show you, uh, talk a little bit more about how that applies to a rigid. The same theory can be applied to a rigid. The graphic design. It's dark because it's dark, and it's light because it's light, and it's not necessarily a sculpted idea. You don't want to make it too complicated. Just plug in the values you want as a graphic. It is a flat canvas, it is a flat piece of paper. You need to deal with that surface design. Then, secondarily, it's dark because it's turning. The wall. So it kind of imposes a logic back on top of it. Try and pick up what it is, what you see. And you'll specifically try and break it into three values, sometimes four, sometimes two, and three give you a good range. What's dark, what's light, what's middle? Almost everything, even something that's complicated, can be worked out as that idea. And that's going to help you organize or order the picture. When you're dealing then with a different value, different value, it's finally that's why we're doing what we said before. You're going to start thinking like boxes. You're trying to then come back around the second time to make sure it's dark because it's shadow and this doesn't go light as a shadow. Make sure all the shadow is dark. All the side planes give you similar values. It's still the big stuff, but eventually all the little stuff too. All the front planes are light factors. Uh, all the background dark shadow. So you're going to order it then, first just graphically. This is flat value and shape. Then you're going to come through and think about the boxes and make sure, give or take the local uh, coloring, that all the side planes get darker. All the bottom planes get darker. And then you can fix up the order of these two. You want to make sure you're consistent in space. To create levels in space. Now what you want to do, I always think of a game board. <coughs> Those little cutout toy you get as a kid. It's not a real soldier, it's a cutout soldier. It's got a cutout castle behind it, a cutout wagon. What you're going to do is you're going to put the uh, you're using bushes, and the bushes are the closest thing to this. And then there's little cows. And all the cows work in this section, and then there's a uh, mount. I've got four levels of space here. I need to create four values or four value ranges for those levels of space. The simplest statement would be just a figure against the wall, this logic against the wall. And I could say that the figure is light and the background is dark. Well, the figure is dark and the background is light. But the figure is 
light and dark, and the background is middle. Or the background is light and dark, and the figure is middle. <clears throat> Those are your four combinations of light on dark, dark on light, full value on limited value, or limited value on full value. But what you're really doing when you do that, when you're in brass doing that, or when Ruben's doing that, is saying that things that are closer to us are light, and things that are farther behind us are dark. And that creates that separation in space. We even do that with the simplest two levels, or you can do it with three levels, or 12 levels. You can do it with several levels, up to five levels you can do pretty easily, pretty clearly. And the way you do it is you assign a value. Bushes are dark bushes. Cows are Jersey cows, so they're light and dark. Mountains are a middle value, and the sky is a middle light value. We use four values. What you can also do, generally, is if we have a couple levels between one, two, three, four, you can get away with one and four being about the same value. And usually it'll be okay. Let me do it this way. Here's a uh, dark series of something. Here's a middle series of something. Here's a middle light something. And here's my dark stormy sky. Now these one and four are the same value, but because you have enough space between them, and enough rendering and general effect perspective, you can kind of get away with that. And still as a graphic design, it will sit flat because you've created so much information between the audience is going to buy it and not have too much time. It would be better if we could make it different that. Like if you get a couple levels between, we're usually okay. But generally speaking, we want to make each level its own value. Now the problem with both the boxy thinking, turning everything to the left darker, letting things go darker or lighter or changing values in the back of space, is you've got to render it. You've got to put something on top. So what will happen is, once you start doing your technique, instead of different value, different plane, there will be different value range. The rendering will create some variation of value. So now instead of just having number one value, you have maybe one to three. Instead of five, you have four to six. There'll be a value range as you render. And you can see again that's what Ruben's doing. The middle value, the middle light to dark. It's a foreground background relationship. Well, this is rendered flesh so. But look how light the shadows are. Look how dark the shadows could have been. The Rembrandt view, which is this one. And you want to make sure the whole figure separates from the background. The Rembrandt gets interested in the light of the figure separating from the background. Because Rembrandt does religious paintings. And Rembrandt wants to let you know that for you to be an autonomous, complete soul, for you to emerge from the darkness, you have to be led by the light of God. So I fall back into the shadow of the universe, whatever you want to be into that. And I emerge with this illumination. And you can see how it's this beautiful, glorious, and for him spiritual illumination. Somewhere from above, it's being lit. And almost every painting he does is a religious painting. His portrait is just beautiful. Now, this was Aphrodite, Venus, and Mir. He didn't have this kind of like concept. I want all the figures, I want this full, glorious flesh to separate from the background so you can feel that. And so 
I'll look at the highlight, and look at the shadow. Look at the darkest shadow of the flesh and the lightest light of the flesh. Look how close in time you have. Look at the highlight of the forehead, look at the highlight of the chin. The more value range between highlights here almost than there is between highlight and shadow on this. So we separate the whole figure. But this is a value range that is separated from the value range back here. But this is, say, uh, 3 to 6, or 9 to 10 separation. So once you do your value range, if you do, well, it's just the numbers might be easy. If I had a uh, value 1, 5, and 10, my three values, just at the graphic level, that would be clear separations. Well, probably what I want to do, in most cases, is I want to group two of the values closer. So the middle value will probably be closer to the dark than the light on the red brand, and that will frame that light and create that sense of illumination. So if I make the, uh, the middle value closer to the dark, then the light is the thing that separates the most. If I make the middle value closer to the light, then the dark is what separates the most. So usually instead of 1, 5, 10, they'll do 1, 7, or 8. 10, or 1, 3, 10, or it might be 3, 5, 10, or 3, 5, 8, or it be any combination. But usually, two of the values will be a little closer than the other. Just like in a movie, you might have a love story, but usually one of the characters is a little stronger than the other characters. I know it's like X-Men last night. And it was this ensemble. You had a bunch of villains, you had a bunch of heroes. Well, one villain was the main guy, Magneto. And he was the evil guy, so we got to see more of him. And one guy was the main guy in the next one, was more great. We got to see more of him. So even though we got to meet all of them, they all had their fight scenes, they all had their tricky dialogue, they centered on one in the hero camp and one in the villain camp. And in between the two, Wolverine got more than Magneto. In between those two conflicts, he got even more. So he was the main character. He got a little bit more. The love story, Harry met Sally. Sally is from Sally's point. Harry gets a little less screen time. It makes it more interesting if one stands out a little more from the other one or two. And so we'll group them. Well, if we're rendering, then we'll want to do one to three. And then let's just keep it at five. Five to seven and 8 to 10. Or you can do 1 to 4, 4 to 7, 6 and a half to 10. It's okay if they overlap a little bit, because overall it's still a darker range, even though little bits of the dark value creep into the middle, and little bits of the middle creep into the light. It's still overall dark. Now Magneto, with this cute little kid who had a rough childhood, you feel sorry for the nice little kid. But overall, he was still, still a rock villain. But there's a couple of scenes where it showed him a little bit sympathetic. You can get away with that. So those value ranges can slightly overlap each other. But this will still overall be light, this will be heavy and dark. But there can be a slight mixing. So what the real challenge here is too then. We need to design a nice value pattern, light, middle, and dark, so we organize and we order the world within this system. And then we need to render within that value range. So what's the light stuff here? Light flesh, light background, and light shirt, and light sky eyes. And then middle value, and then dark value. Look at how light the folds get here. Now he could have pushed those really dark, but he didn't. And look at how dark the highlights get here. He could have pushed those with the light he did. Look at how the middle value is closer to the dark than the light. Same principles. So can we render in such a way 
look at her light flesh and light fabric, beautifully rendered, not making much more realistic than this, but look at the darkest fold there. Now every once in a while I can get into a little crevice and go really dark, and nobody's going to notice. But the overall pattern, the lightest fold to the darkest fold, is very limited. And that becomes a problem when you try and finish off the painting. Can I design it as a simple three-value system, and then can I render it out to completion and still hold that idea? No matter how much detail I render within the fabric, it still stays light. No matter, no matter how much detail I render into the trees, it still stays dark. And that becomes a big problem. If you think in terms of three values, what's metal, what's light, and what's dark, we learn to do that after some practice, and then we render the light darker, the darker light, everything's real value again. It's lost its impact. You render light leaves on here, you render dark folds in here, they end up being basically the same value. The more you render, the muddier the system is. The more beautiful the technique is, the more wondrous the color variations are, but the murkier the tonal composition is. Your painting is going to work or not work on the total composition. Middle and dark foregrounds, light background. If I did this, it becomes murkier. Everything's getting a little more middle value. I just made it about the tree. If this was the six figures sitting on the grass, it'd be a muddy mess, no matter how beautifully it's working. We need to create a substantial value in it. Does it have to be white to black? No. Can it be three to six, the whole thing? Yeah. But then what's number three has to have almost no variation in it. And what's number six has to have almost no variation? as you did here, almost nothing in terms of value range in the ring range. So the closer your, your overall composition is in terms of value, the less range you can play with in the ring range. The more and more graphic it has to stay. If it's a subtle composition, then the render range in each silhouette has to be reduced gradually. Best artists do that even when it's a full value. Look at these folds up here. Not very dark. A few get fairly dark, but most of them stay very light. Even the darkest ones aren't all that dark. They never get this dark. And look at the variation between cloud and sky. Clouds could well have been this light. We wanted to make that last plane. One, this is all one level, so we close to two, three. Full value close to us, dark value in the middle ground, middle light in the background. So Used four values to do this. Middle light, middle dark, dark light. So the subtler the silhouettes, not big difference between these values, look how close in value the hair is. You've got the ring ones, you've got even highlights in there that are really useful. Look at how close in value the render is in the shadow. Look how close in value I mean, just that highlight the render it is in the light. Because this is a subtler painting in this. Look at the change in here, almost white very dark in the light side. Because look at how limited it is, how far it's supposed to be right here. So if you've got your big jump between light to middle, or light to dark, then you can render more value range within any silhouette. If it's very close, then the rendering has to be close enough. It doesn't have to be less detail. The detail has to vary less within its silhouette. From ringlet to ringlet, thread to thread the fabric, the muscle to muscle in the arm, the variations have to be reduced so that the silhouette is maintained. So let's stop there for our next session. Separate the claims of form with value differences and how much you separate the claims of space and value differences.
know, whatever detail gets packed into those areas then destroy that basic design that you've created. And if it starts out light, then no matter how much rendering you do in there, it's still overall light. If it starts out dark, no matter how much rendering you do, it's overall dark. It's the overall impression is the same. I go to a movie, it's scary, there's two really funny jokes, but 43 really scary scenes, it's overall real scary, even though there's a little bit of, of uh, cheating on that idea. The overall impression when I leave that story is of scary. The overall impression, you see my painting, it's as scary as that guy. But it's, it should be overall dark, overall middle, overall light. The silhouette, the integrity of the silhouette is held. So we have then shape and value based on three values. And then what we can do before we ever start the rendering process, we can go through three more steps of fine tuning our design. The rendering is going to create a value range instead of one, it's one to three or whatever it is. But before we ever get to that, we can do two other graphic steps. And they will either be, instead of having to render all the detail, or as a supplement at the beginning to that. So the first is just getting your graphic back three value system. Then you can do gradations. Within that value system. So I've got a, a dark figure on a light background. That's my two value system, two planes of space. Foreground figure, background wall. Now, if I gradated the, the white background from middle to light, what's that do? I still get a dark foreground and a light background, but I now see the head before I see the bottom of the body. Because the head is in starker contrast to the bottom. This is dark to light. This is dark to middle, or middle dark to light. If I gradated the figure this way, darker on top, middle on the bottom. Now we barely see the bottom of the figure, and even more powerfully see the top of the figure. If I gradated it from bottom left corner to upper right corner, now I see the top of the figure before the bottom of the figure, and I see the right side of the figure before the left side of the figure. Now instead of seeing all of the figure, if breaking away graphically from all the ground, or just seeing the top of the figure separating more than the bottom of the ground, now I fine tuned it to the top right head and shoulder. Maybe that's where the pirate has the parrot, and the parrot's giving us the clue to where the treasure is. So my illustration wants to focus on him. The pirate's more of this evil guy with a blink. Eye, and he's got a hit in shadow. We see that more powerfully. So it's storytelling. In other words, what we can do is take our basic design, shape and values, of fundamental design, and we can fine tune it to an amazing degree just by gradating in any direction, in any combination of any or all of the silhouettes up there. Dark window, dark figure. I'm going to gradate it from the upper left to the lower right. Now it's the middle value, the night scene, so the middle value background, dark value figure, the middle value figure, and 
dark window, we see the window and the head about the same now. I don't want that to happen. I get a gradation. Now I see the head a little quicker than the figure. I can do a gradation on the window. Now I almost lose the bottom corner of the window, but I still strongly see the head. So now I've taken something that goes in competition and made one more dollar. Steve, since that's what you're sort of making us do here today, what you're yeah. saying is if our setup isn't necessarily like this, but we want to add drama, interest, whatever, we should basically, in a sense, do small studies using this method, then take what we see and do it the way we yeah. want it to be. Yeah, when, why did I put his head in shadow? Exactly so you can do this. From here down, he's in light. This is the lightest area here on his hip. This is the shadow. It's not a very dark shadow. But we have so much fill light, sky lights, fluorescent lights, north lights. I mean, so the shadow's really light. He ends up being about the same value as the background. So you end up with a, in terms of our graphic design, we end up with a, we'll make this all mirror. That and then you have a middle value shadow. And then middle value background. And then there's some dark areas there too on the shadow wood. Well, let's just pretend it's two values. In terms of design. There would be no head. So you wouldn't have this horse. You don't. The head is the same value as the mirror. And we don't force it into a different value. We don't render the dark sockets and the lighter cheek and drag out of it a separation that's not really there. We'll go ahead and let it be lost. In the situation like the one we just said that, where the head is uh, of the same value. Probably, but not necessarily. Is it of any interest in all terms? Not much interest. A little greener, a little browner, slightly lighter, slightly darker. separate out is where the strength of your design is. Because what then is left over, what does separate becomes more powerful. When you withhold information, what's left is more, more pregnant with meaning. You know, if you've got to see this old actor's trick, he can't hardly contain himself because he knows he's a millionaire. He can't hardly contain himself because he knows he has a terminal cancer. But he has exactly the same look. Paul Newman does that all the time. Exactly the same look in his face. And as the audience would go, he's trying to hold back all that pleasure so nobody knows he's so happy. And the next scene, you know, he's trying to hold back all his grief because he doesn't want everything but how sad he is. We'll read into it for me. I don't have to go with the quivery lip and the eyes well up. You don't need that. If you're non-committal but just there, in context, the audience will read it. So if this gets faded off, in context of what we see, they'll give you all the box of hair, all the convolutions of the ear, all the reflected light. They'll believe it's there. They'll walk away and remember you have a real look. And it was never even shown. Never even separated. You don't think it was separate. And it's more powerful now because it involves them. They have to help out. So, yeah, we could do it a little redder, a little greener, or whatever, and be fine. Or you could say, it's, I want the whole figure to separate from the background. And the fact is, the hair gets darker, 
and the darkest parts of the shadow get darker than the background. So I'm going to take the overall dark accents and take that as the main idea. And I'm going to make it a dark middle and light figure on the middle background, a full value figure. And I'm still not going to separate all this stuff. In terms of design, it's not dark, middle, and light. Now, if I wanted the hip to be stronger than this, I'd do a gradation of middle, light, to light. And if I want the hip to be stronger than the leg and the drapery, I'd do it this way. Now, you'll see this before you'll see that. And the more dramatically I gradate it, the closer it gets in its darkest gradations to the next step down, the more dramatic that area that's held will become. And I want the front of the face to be more lost from the back of the head. So we'll do a gradation this way. And now this is a little stronger than this.
make it a rendering problem second to that. I mean, you can make it super rendering, but if you control the values, light, dim, and dark, you're going to get more power. If I make it about the same value, it's less interesting than if it's distinctly different values. So that's the game you play, and then it's super real or super stylized. That's up to you. So let's stop there. Let's do our next set. Okay, so we've got shape and value, that's a fundamental design. Gradation then fine tunes our design. It takes that basic impact of light jumping out from middle of dark or dark pulling away from middle of light, whatever it is, and refines it so that we can get you to look at very specific moments at very specific times. In other words, you can piece the storytelling. We can create a chapter number one, number two, number three, number six, and seven, all the way through, rather than just say it's all there at once. It can be overwhelming, or if nothing else, you get the, the idea so quick to get bored. And that's one of the big problems in our work, is even when it's well designed as in shape and value, once you got it, you got it. And it only takes me 2.4 seconds to be the full board. That's how they stage those things out. You should drive down the freeway they figure you got about that much time to read. If it takes longer, you don't get the message. And if you get the message that quick, that's great to advertise, but it's not good if you have dialogue. You want to keep them there for a while. Keep them there because you have something really important to say, or keep them there because you don't want them to go to the next painting and maybe buy it out, suck them into this and keep them there. So you want this big impact to draw them in or subtle impact. And then you want these layers of revelations. Oh, that head's getting lost there. I can't quite see that eye socket. Is that glimmer in his eye? Is he smiling or frowning? Where's his hands? I start to use those things. Look at that subtle transition of the form of the pool. Those kind of movements, subtle movements, keep them there longer. Thick paint to thin, from graphic to realistic. Those architectural shape to, to uh, organic shape. If you can start to add on top of the basic poster image that you created, these subtleties, you've now got them involved in the pull them in and be more subtle in your body. Once we've got the gradation, now we have a choice. We could go on to our rendering and just render every little cheekbone perfectly, build up the surface texture differences, build up the abstract quality of the paint, the impasto, or the, or the rug out, spray bit, or work with a palette knife. We do all that rendering stuff on top of it. Or you could say, well, instead of doing all that stuff, we're going to deal with edges. Well, one of the things about edges, if you go straight to edges, it's going to be quicker than doing all the detail for us, and you'll get a rendered feeling without having to render so much. And what you'll find is when you look at beautiful paintings, you'll see all these subtle variations of value, and most of them will just be how the three or four values blend together. If I make this dark, and this middle, and this light, when I start to blend the thick hair to the thinner sideburn to the, uh, the uh, five o'clock shadow, that transition is going to create the sense of three or four or five values. And it's really just blending the value of the dark hair to the middle value shadow of the face. And that transition gave the impression of many values when it was only just one movement between two values but the transition gives you more. So when you do the edges, you start to get that rounding of the ball in the two, that rendering, but also, and you get this with gradation too, you start to get a sense of many values 
but it was really just based on the two or three or four value system. Gradation does that and blend does that. When I blend my edges, I have the seven edges that we had, but I can have three basic ones. Hard, soft, and lost. All the other ones are just variations of soft. And I want to think of it in, a, in a three ways on this. One would be the design factor, just like gradation. If I have a really light value, it gives a really dark value. And a really light value gives a really dark value. Maybe I want you to look here first. So I can do a gradation and gradate this middle light to light, middle light to light, and make you look there first, over here. Or instead of, or on top of that, I can play with edges. Because if I make this a soft edge, that's going to be less interesting than a hard edge. And if I make this a lost edge, so you can't really see where one begins and the other ends. This all kind of fades into a motion car. That's going to be even less interesting. I'll probably in there someplace, but I can never find the edge. I can feel the rib cage, but it's softer, so you can't get it that exactly. I know I like it exactly where they hit me. Hard, soft, and lost also is the contrasting idea. Hard edge is greater contrast than soft. Soft is greater than lost. Each then will attract more to less interest. So you can see now the possibilities. I could do almost the same value in lost edge. And you wouldn't even pay any attention hardly to the full effects. I could do almost the same value in soft edge. I can do almost the same value in a hard edge. So graphically, they're very separate, but value-wise, they're almost the same. Or they're very different in value, but they're completely lost in edge, or any combination. So now by creating a hard, soft, lost, I get my three values of three edges. And then against that, I have gradations within those values, between those edges. The variations are different. Three different values combining things in many different ways. Gradating any one of those shapes in any direction of the compass. Blending any of the edges in any of the three ways. Think of how many different, it's just exponential, how many combinations you have. Some will be radically different, some will just be subtly different. If I make this uninteresting edge soft instead of hard, it makes almost no impact on the whole. But if I make this a lost edge, the light torso is just flaring off into the dark background. And make this a hard edge, that's going to be quite a different effect than the one that's all hard edge, the one that's all soft edge, not lost at all. That'll have a big impact. That'll be this spiritual glow or this fuzzy diffusion. It'll have a completely different feel. So the edges create a design difference. It also um, creates a second one. It also creates a form difference. Blending the edges is a form idea. If I take my dark shadow, my light light, and blend them, that's going to round the form. So as I add softer and softer edges, it makes it rounder and rounder. Harder and harder makes it squarer and squarer. The, um, this will do is the I can't remember what I'm doing. Basically, that you can turn the form instead of square to round, and you can fine tune the design 
all of the gradation by creating more or less interest between us. The other edges, hard loss, soft, there's a broken edge. That's where maybe twists of hair break off into the background, or I guess the painter and stroke drags off in the background. A jagged edge would be where if you did a painterly dragging stroke, you just did this and drag back and forth into it. You end up getting this jagged stroke or jagged stroke. Well, it can have all sorts of effects, but I'm just talking about this is really just I don't know if there's a this is really just about how colors work together, how values work together. So the edges can just create an abstract interest. It can just be interesting how your edges, how your colors or values meet. So one of the things we want is we want the paint on an abstract level to be interesting. Thick, juicy paint, glazed over paint, sanded away paint, rubbed out, canvas left to see through. All those things create an abstract difference that doesn't really have any impact necessarily on the form. I could make this highlight rub back to the white canvas, pile on with thick paint, sand it back down to the underpainting below. We can do several things to get the shape and value of the rendering ball you want, all of which would turn the form, all of which would be a design possibility in terms of seeing things more or less quickly. But each would have a different abstract level. That juicy, rich paint, that ragged, uh, scraggly, wet over dry buildup paint, the glazing where it sinks into the cracks, all those things are different. Rubbed out, where you actually see the canvas showing through when you thought it was a scope, it's an additional canvas. All of those things, and good painters will use all of them. And they're just on one level, just the, the pure enjoyment of how paint comes together, how color comes together, how value comes together. There should be a thrill and an exploration just on how that happens irrespective of whether it's a cheap bone, whether it's graphic, whether it's miles back in the distance or right up in your face. There should be a joy of that. And that was what Rembrandt taught us in the It's just the joy of paint. It's just this beautifully rendered form, incredible sense of life. But there's this absolute delight in how paint is applied. Here you apply it like sergeant wood. Here it's glazed back like next to the air. Here it's just build up, glazed down, build up. And you see all these possibilities. So if we just have the strokes cutting into the other silhouette just to, as they sloppily meet that uh, work full the silhouette, it's a ragged edge. If they actually just joint because of the dry brush, you dragged it over, it didn't quite cover the dark underneath, or you had one to let it kind of break away the limb, a couple of loose leaves off the bottom of the tree, that's a broken edge, jagged and broken. It could also be three step, I call it, but it could be 86 steps. Like fast to the diamond, you could do dark or light, and then you can blend them to create that turn of the ball. Or you can come in with a third value or a third color, like a new facet to diamond. So each one would be edge, but it would be brown shadow, pink flesh, rosy, dark red cheek, and it would be more Yeah. See, we're talking about a level of painting that goes past the image. Once you learn how to paint, basically, you go to this level, which is enjoying the image 
consider it and pay for what it is. Other so this is done through the process and not after the process, in a sense. This is done as one of these. Well, it's, it could be done after. Yeah, the it's, it, it, hopefully it's all connected. It's a unified process with all bonds, even though you have to pay one part of the time. You have it all the time. You have the whole design of the building in mind before you ever lay the foundation. That's the best thing. Sometimes that work that way. You're thinking of one thing and then you consider another, or you're talking of going this way, and you see something happens, or you should go a different way. So it's an organic process. It may be linear, may branch off on trees, may come out of you like a Mozart symphony all at once. But technically, this is not an all or prima approach. It's anything. Really? Yeah. It's how, yeah, it's all of those things. It's any, any way you paint. Unless you're going to do a tall boy, unless you're going to try to fool the eye and think that it's not painting an image or a photorealism or something like this, uh, then it's going to, whatever technique you use, is going to be at least partly about the medium itself. I chose the medium to I chose the medium to hide the medium, or I chose the medium to, uh, to expose the process of the medium for somewhere in between. It's this mysterious surface that I'll never know how to draw through. Or it's a transparent process that just shows you how simple and beautiful painting can be. So any technique should have its abstract quality, which is the pure love of that technique. The best part is you should have great respect for its form. You know, if you go to a, a movie, Hollywood just pumping out a genre that was able to be successful. There's something inherently lacking respect in that art. It comes through on some level. Even a pretty good movie, who did better if we felt the filmmakers have fundamental respect for the process? Well, like Sleepy Hollow, not a so great film, but you really felt like he had a love for the little gothic comic book ideas, the gothic horror novels. There was a real reverence of this pure pleasure trying to mimic that and that. that comes through in the movie. In the world. So there should be this sense of an excitement about the process of the medium you use itself. And how that comes out is how it's very fundamentally how the two colors come together. How many interesting ways do you make them come together? Right? Do you use all these ways or am I going to Say this is my way. This is love soft edges, everything's a soft. This is love hard edges, everything's rapid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lubus and uh, all those guys, they kind of send in the sergeant. And they're all soft and hard, too hard. It's soft, not too many loss. There's no jag and wagging. Uh, some three step in so uh, three step in is like facets of the diamond. You just add a, a second color between the two colors. But it might be three or four colors. It might be shadow of the back of the arm, and then half tone of the arm, highlight of the arm, dark half tone of the arm. You might end up with four or five different colors or different values just as you block it out. Sword does that. Sword Sergeant will take them and blend them together so they can be a soft edge. With just a couple of hard edge passes. But the effect is a soft edge because when you step back, the uh, yellow, orange, red blends into the rainbow variation. You get up, you might see the distinct separation of three colors, the three values. But when you get back, it will seem like a variation. For the effect of soft edge. And then the last one is blind. And quite often it's done with a lost edge. The God will do this, Sergeant will sometimes do this, a lot of the painters will do it. He has lost the arm, then you come back and with a little bit of color you pick it up. Or you've got the pink arm and the pink breast on the little cherub, and then you come back with a deep red little line to separate the dark shadow of the arm. Or the ear gets lost in the background, you come back and pick up the 
dark edge in the ear. And so you lost it or smoothed it out. It could have been over any of these really, but quite often sort of lost it. And you just come back with a line, an artist convention, to carve it back out. The sergeant will do that all the time, but he will mask it as a thin plane. So you dig out the dark crease of the eyelid. It's just a line, but it's actually a tight of shadow to the same thing with this. Same thing with that, same thing with the pitch, that press of the lips. But it could also be done here, this fades away. He's used it all over the place. Look at the shoulder there. Look at the edge of the fabric here, 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 here. Here, his line. This is a highly drawn thing. Is this is really all his texture? A little bit of modeling to it, but then he comes back and he draws. As much drawing as it is painting. Like that. Look at this. That's a thin shadow. But it's really just a drawn line. Isn't it? This is fully rendered. But this, the texture of the arm and the texture of the color of the fabric here. Photo have gotten lost. You can see up here they blended between the same color, transferred into some material like flesh, faded together, it came back and separated the other one. Here it faded together, didn't separate, they didn't reach out. So those would be the idea. You can find that stuff in lots of paintings, and it's a real kind of pleasures. Look at a painting from the distance and say, yeah, look how real and beautifully sculpted. Why not even look at it? And yet it has a volume. It has a volume because of the silhouettes, different kinds of plane, different kinds of plane. When you come back then and you accent a plane, or you rediscover the separation of two lost planes, or you find them. It's real kind of neat to find that. If you didn't realize it was there, that's the abstract joy medium is when the audience comes in and digs into the painting and all of a sudden sees that they never saw it before and comes up to it with a perspective. Those kind of things are cool because they're going to walk up because you have that nice design to it. And they're going to stay there because they find these little pressures. But if you look at just a straight painter who's always doing the chisel stroke everywhere, no surprises. There's a mountain, there's a peach, the same kind of clunky strokes, the same kind of smooth, buttery, blending. It's what happens. Every once in a while you dig out a dark edge, you drag away a silhouette, you lose a silhouette, you break two colors into four broken colors. Seurat does that three step and he does it everywhere in little rock. So it goes like three step. And all over. It's the same idea. You get this gradation of pink and green of light and dark for the background with all these little things. So, um, we have two minutes. Good luck.